Hello, Blenders, and welcome. Welcome to episode number 271 of Real Blend, a podcast that's powered by Kennergy. My name is Sean O'Connell. I'm the managing editor here at Cinnamon Blend. On this week's show, Oppenheimer is here. Barbie is here. And then that film's director, Greta Gerwig, is going to join us to discuss her brand new film. God, we are so excited to have Greta join the show, especially after having Nolan on last week's show. And we want to thank everybody right off the bat who came around to Real Blend, maybe checked out Real Blend for the very first time and listened to the show and listened to our conversation with uh, Christopher Nolan, which was a fantastic to have. Uh, let me introduce the boys. I will get right to Kevin McCarthy of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. Kevin, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. And Sean, Jake and Gabe, good to see you guys as always. I just want to say I'm very happy about this week. This is a big week for cinema. Um, I don't believe that these films are in competition. This is a just a great weekend to go to the movies, see two films that are directed by two phenomenal filmmakers. It just feels like an event weekend. And to have a podcast that had Christopher Nolan on last week and then have Greta Gerwig on this week, uh, it just feels like we're in a historic moment in cinema just in general. Um, I've never seen something like this before. The articles that I'm seeing were thousands and thousands of people are booking double features to see yeah. these movies and they're calling it quote unquote Barbenheimer. So it, it's a it's just a really cool time to be to have a film podcast, but also just to be a part of this time in cinema. It's awesome. Uh, the other chair is Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago. Hello, handsome. How are you? I'm doing well. Yeah, I haven't felt this kind of energy at the movies since The Dark Mama which was the simultaneous <laughs> release of The Dark Knight and Mamma Mia on the exact same day, 15 years ago. So, and no, uh, Nolan again. Nolan again, I'm saying, you know, that like I, I saw something online that, that summed it up perfectly. The Dark Mama walked so Barbenheimer could run. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Wait, did, didn't Dunkirk come out the same weekend as Girls Trip? My That's pretty that? funny. That's pretty funny if no Nolan is like circling weekends <laughs> with like... <laughs> Or is it the, I think it's the other way around. I think oh, Nolan think picks so? his date and they go, let's counter Nolan. Yeah. All right. Sure. That's possible. What's, yeah. What's actually fascinating is that the day we're recording this episode is the six year, six year anniversary of the day Dunkirk opened. And, and yesterday was week, the 15th anniversary of Dark Knight. Yeah. That's why that's what I was about to say. Because like, this is kind of a, this is his favorite. This week and this this week in particular. Because it looks mainly so, opened so his films in July. Interstellar so, was was November, right? Interstellar was November. So basically, I think Dark Knight was July 18th. Dark, uh, Dunkirk was July 19th. Oppenheimer was <laughs> July 21st. That's Prestige funny. felt feels like it was the fall. Yeah, it feels like. Well, some of them were probably awards plays. Sure, I'm sure, sure, sure. The so. Prestige should have been an awards play. I'm a little afraid Oppenheimer's coming out a little bit too early. Oh, for oh, I mean, oh, everything no. everywhere no. all at once came out in April or March. I know. So, yeah, 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 you know, I, I think it's and also I we have it. absolutely no idea what the next six months of this industry is going to look like. Yeah, very true. So, yeah, so for those and of you also, listening, I hope you're appreciating these amazing interviews we're bringing you because we're about to have nothing. Yeah, for a while. Go dry. It's, it's going to uh, go dry. We're going to recycle some myths. Yeah. <laughs> also, um, Dunkirk was, as I mentioned, released in July, went on to be nominated for multiple Academy Awards, including Best Picture. I think it was True. Nolan's first director nomination as well, which I is believe, insane. which is insane. insane. But uh, but yeah, oh, this wow, is a cool crazy. week. I love this week. So. Uh, OK, uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, well, let me say hello to Gabe Kovach in the producer's chair. Hello, Gabe. Look how, how handsome he is. Big couple Gabe's weeks, huh? Big couple Gabe's, weeks. Whew, it has been massive. Yes, yeah. we've been very thankful for the people who have come to check the show out, uh, especially on the YouTube channel, which has picked mm -hmm. up a couple hundred subscribers. Thank you very much, guys, for heading over there. Realblend.com, uh, YouTube.com backslash Realblend uh, podcast. And then you can hit subscribe and turn on notifications and then use the comments down below to let us know. Uh, first off, what you think about the Greta interview, which we're going to throw to in a second. And then we will have uh, a question that we throw out to you guys that we want you guys to answer. Uh, and I've got something fun lined up for you guys that I will announce at the end of the show. Of course, we're available all the different places where you get your normal audio podcast needs met. And if you want to sign up for Real Blend Premium, you get an ad free version of the show of the podcast and a newsletter from me. Every other Friday this week is not newsletter week in case you're waiting for it and looking in your inbox, but I'll have another one ready for you guys next week. And I'm going to, I think, address some of the um, questions that people have been asking about box office type stuff, because the box office has been a big topic this summer. Um, and we've gotten a bunch of emails about people wondering for our thoughts on things like um, Dial of Destiny 
and Flash doing so poorly. And uh, so maybe I'll try to address some of that in in the uh, in the newsletter when we get up to that point. But in the meantime, we have a very, very exciting interview, someone who we pursued from the moment that we found out that this was going to be a movie, uh, someone whose work that we deeply admire. Um, and we were thrilled that she decided to sit down for 30 minutes. Uh, Greta Gerwig has a new film coming out in theaters. You might have heard of it at this point now. It's called Barbie. Uh, stars Margot Robbie and um, Ryan Gosling and then a ton of other people in all-star supporting parts. And she is a guest on the Real Blend podcast. So without further ado, I'm going to throw it right to Greta Gerwig joining the Real Blend podcast to discuss Barbie. <laughs> This is so crazy. Yeah, well, we have to understand we've yeah. done 10,000 junkets here and it's never been like this ever. Yeah, before we start with our first question, can we just set the scene, Greta? Like, where are we right now? Like, there's a camera that's yes. pink right behind you. Like, like just for our audience, because this is going to be on video. Like, Well, you know, I mean, I'm just sort of taking this in for the first time. I didn't know. I mean, I knew they were going to do something extraordinary, but I didn't know. Like, I mean, I think that nobody can see, but the hallway with all the doors wrapped. Yeah. I mean, everything about it is just amazing. But I do know, like, this camera and there's a boom behind you that's pink. Those were both used in the movie. Oh, really? Um, yes, I remember used, that in the film. Yeah, okay. in the pre uh, presidential um, Oval that's Office. That's fantastic. Um, the camera woman is using it, and another uh, the sound woman is holding that boom. So I didn't even know they brought in. I saw the car this morning yeah. when I came in of the 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 vet, the, the Barbie Corvette. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, yes. it's just like, it still makes me so happy. All of the objects. It's well, not to get too nerdy, but like the gaffer tape on the floor is pink. They know how they, they brought it right. Yes. I know. It's incredible. It, it's truly, this is beyond anything I, I could have imagined. Well, we're honored to have you on our show. We're a filmmaking show who celebrates all the different aspects of filmmaking, score, cinematography. I want to talk about Rodrigo Prieto, everybody who's yeah. involved in this film. But I'm going to start off with a larger picture question because the idea of humans only have one ending but ideas yeah. live forever. Yeah. As a filmmaker, you're putting work out into the world with Lady Bird, Little Women, films like this that are going to be very important for people as they watch them in different generations. But I, the idea of your ideas living on forever as a storyteller, what does that line mean to you as, as a storyteller and the idea that people are going to find this later on? Right. Uh, well, you know, I think... I can't possibly know, um, you know, after after we're all gone, I don't know what like survives or doesn't survive. But I do feel that there is something, um, you know, I'm a film lover of uh, that. That's sort of like why I want to make movies is I love movies. And there is something incredible about, you know, w watching a film, uh, you know, from I, my my favorites are like from the 30s, like Ernst Lubitsch and Howard Hawks and Preston Sturges and thinking like, that is, you can reach back in time and there are these sparkling gems that still exist. And I mean, that goes to just, you know, for me, I, I, I see myself in a continuity of filmmakers over time in this medium I'm so lucky to be part of. And mm -hmm. but I think particularly for Barbie, what felt so important to me about that is that I you know, she's this queen of plastic and she's this unchanging thing. And that, and that what we live in, in time as humans is just, it's all sort of going. And I think, um, to me, it's like to make a film is to say, like, it's almost this instinct of like drawing, drawing on a cave wall. This is how, this is how it was at this moment. Mm. This is how I see it. This is, this is my perspective. And I think, um, kind of, always connecting the desire to make with the fact that we are temporary mm. is inherent for me. If that's, I, I, I'm sorry if that's too esoteric. No, um, no, that's, that's, that's what we're but, here for. But you you started with a really deep one. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, the, that's the one that I walked away thinking about the most. To be yeah. Honest. yeah. It was that or what attracted you to the film. So yeah, we were going yeah, back yeah. and forth. Okay, yeah, no, yeah. of course. No, I'm happy to, but, but it is, it is really like, I mean, this is all going. I'm sorry. I feel like it's it's like we're all just on you know on on some timeline we don't yes. know about, and that like it is kind of a way to be like here's the doll, here's the object, here's the film, here's the thing, yep. and like I don't know what persists, but here's my 
here's my contribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Cool. There's a thing that's started happening to me as I've gotten older, and I feel like mm -hmm. everyone experiences it, where you yeah. watch a movie you loved as a kid, yes. and it's a completely different film, because you recognize yes. themes yeah. and jokes yeah. that yeah. just maybe when you were seven or eight you didn't get. Yeah. So I want to talk about, <laughs> as a filmmaker, making two movies at the same time, because yeah. I feel like there could be an eight-year-old girl who sees this, loves it for what it is, yeah. revisits it in 20 years later, and it's the, the film hasn't changed, we've changed, yeah. and it's a completely different experience. How much thought did you go into with every line of the script and every shot thinking for the person who's going to watch this when they're eight versus the person who's going to watch this when they're 28. Yeah. Well, I, I think for me, it was always trying to keep those double consciousnesses in mind of mm -hmm. like who I was as a child and what you um, love as a child, particularly about something like Barbie yeah. and that kind of fantasy of it. And then being able to look at it as an adult and having a, a different way of coming at it. And I, and keeping them both alive and trying to respect both. Um, and that, that doesn't feel that different for me for what I've done in in all my films, really. It's, I mean, even with, the, like, Lady Bird, there was a sense that I had of, like, how is, this is the mother's movie just as much as it's the daughter's yes. movie. It has to be. And also with Little Women, it was, like, it was a sense of, uh it's the magic of childhood, but only that you see once you're past it. And then how do you hold that joy, but also that ache and that sadness? And I think Barbie, it felt similar that way. Like I'm trying to always hold all of the ways you can see it. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, but I definitely have that experience. I almost have that experience more with books than oh, with really? movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some books I've read where like, I, you know, at 18, I'm so sure I know like, like w w the way to view this. And then when I've read them in like 38, suddenly I think, oh no, I see this very differently yeah. now. And there's certain characters where I'll, I'll judge them at 18. And then when I come back to them, I was like, oh, they really... They weren't to be judged. I, I was wrong. <laughs> well, you brought up an interesting point that I'd love to follow up on, like the idea of it almost feels like Lady Bird, Little Women, and Barbie are like this weird unofficial <laughs> trilogy, trilogy, like yeah. of like this thematic. Like I, like, I, don't, I don't know if they would yeah. ever put them in like a box set, but it really does feel like there's it would be there's an something odd there. box set, yes, yes <laughs> which is. we would buy in a heartbeat. Yeah. Yes, yeah. no, it is. They they are all speaking to each other. That's true, and I think that they all. I mean, for me, what was extraordinary is that even though this is Barbie, which is this, you know. Uh, globally known brand it, it it feels just as personal to me yes. as a filmmaker it and it felt like i was able to make something that was just as to the marrow as anything else i've made and and genuinely that was the only way I knew how to do it. Uh, and I, I, I said, you know, I'm not, I don't need to make a Barbie movie I, if I want to make this one. Mm -hmm. And that that's, uh, because I, otherwise I don't know what I'm doing. Well, that's kind of why our questions <laughs> yeah. are what they are. We don't mean to be like overly deep, but we know like, we just have to ask like when we walk out. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. this is, this yeah, is, this, honestly, this is making me so happy oh. that the Barbie movie just goes straight to like yeah. mortality we, and art we call over each other time. This morning, we're like, we can't ask like, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah so. but launching off his question about the idea of making two films, yeah. Kubrick is kind of a big part of this movie. Okay. Uh, you, have, you, yes. you, have a, you have a Shining yeah. reference. Yeah. Uh, the 2001, there's a Shining line, I believe, at one Shine, point. Yeah, they're yeah. Shining with each other. Yeah, <laughs> which I thought was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the, the 2001 reference is incredible because yeah. the first footage we ever saw was that trailer, which was incredible. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and then your film opens like that, and obviously with the iconic like throwing up and the, sure. the Barbie logo. Um, but can you talk about the idea of using the 2001 and one aspect of it as a narrative uh, storyteller, what that opening is supposed to mean from a narrative perspective and a director. And like, you know, that's a reference yes. that we get, but maybe yeah. a little kid might not. Right. I mean, and we knew that going in. We were like, this is, and there are other Kubrick references. <laughs> are there? Wait, so what, what did we miss? Uh, well, the, um, the way the light and the way the uh, uh, the Mattel boardroom the table is is Doctor Strange. No, yeah. I knew it. <laughs> I, I didn't want to project, but I was like, that looks like that. Yes. That's so like, awesome. there's like other little things, but Hell I mean, yes. I think for me, I mean, obviously, I love Kubrick. Who doesn't love Kubrick? Yeah. And there was something like the kind of taking, you know, to bring in Rodrigo, who's you know. Um, one of the best DPs one of, of the all best time. DPs yeah. Yeah. of all time in paints with God fingers, oh. and I uh, absolutely worship him. I, one thing when we started talking about the film is I was like, I don't want to do it just as like a like a like a parody where we do it kind of quick and dirty and it doesn't really matter. I was so like, I, I was like, we're, we I, I want to do it only if we can like do it. Mm -hmm. I want to do it with 
you know, front screen projection. I want to do it with the original plates. I want to build the set as they had built it. I want to do it like, let's let's make it count. And he was like, OK, let's go. Uh, I mean, you use front screen projection for that. <laughs> we actually ended up not using the full front screen projection because it made the angles too hard to <laughs> uh, work with over time. But what we did do was we used the original plates and we put it in a volume stage, which is like our version of French front screen projection. So wow. we did our version of it, but we did build the set as it was built and we you know, looked at, we, you know, shot for shot the angle of the, you know, the doll coming up and like really tried to do it with integrity because I was like, I don't need this just to be a joke. The only way that this is like funny to me is that if it's executed with the utmost integrity and, you know, excellence, then it becomes both a funny idea and something more. Mm -hmm. And I think too, because I, I love Kubrick and, you know, it, it, his entire filmography is just staggering. Yeah. But I, uh, but it also was there was something funny to me in that like he's also the paragon of a certain type of you know masculine filmmaking, and it just felt like what a fun thing to sort of transpose mm. with respect um, to this doll. Um, mm. and but but yeah, certainly I will say. I, I did have a moment of like, am I really going to start this movie with a 2001? I'm glad you did, yeah. <laughs> Very, but then I, um, <laughs> I ended up talking it through with my therapist, and she thought it was hilarious. <laughs> so I, I was like, well, if, if she thinks it's good. I, <laughs> Can I ask how that goes? Are you in a session going, I'm making this movie, this is yes, what I want to do? Yes. What does this say about me? I don't know what she thinks <laughs> about anything in terms of it. But yes, I say like, I, I mean, she's like, if this is how you want to use this hour, like, you <laughs> <laughs> you can go for it, but um, but yeah. Sometimes I just like to bounce ideas off of her and just she get it. Get like an associate producer credit I on this movie, genuinely, or probably on my whole career. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in therapy once a week. I run stuff by my therapist about my work all the time, so yeah. I, I'm with you. Well, it's a big part of your life, yeah. and also like I mean, for me, it is also it, it is intimate and it is personal, and it is like sort of you know you're looking at why you look at things like this and how, how where these ideas come from and I, I did I, and and she she really laughed and I thought okay well I've done I have had to have sold one person is she thanked in the credits <laughs> no <laughs> no because I feel like that would be um, two on the news. I would be violating something sure. yeah. you know yeah. and she's pretty uh, s strict psychoanalysis yeah, so <laughs> uh, we are pretty we're, we're, we're 30 something year old guys yeah. I did not expect the two of us to be the people laughing hardest in the theater I'm last, so like, we were, happy. like losing our there shit there are jokes yes. in this movie that, that we don't want to ruin for, but that are but in the Vogue article that just came yeah. out recently there is reference to a joke on page one that made, I believe, Margot's jaw drop to the floor. <laughs> and then it says that the joke didn't make it into the movie. And I'm yes. curious as to what that joke was. Oh, well, suffice to say, there was a sort of extended joke with um, um, Marie Curie, which didn't end up being part of it. But yes, there was... Um, there was a there was a first, there was a page one f bomb <laughs> that we were just sort of set the tone for the Who whole thing. Um, well, I, I it was actually it was the it, it, what what the line was was it, it was actually Helen Mirren saying to Marie Curie, "Pipe the fuck down, Marie Curie." <laughs> <laughs> but I that was like my favorite. I was like what? because like you know you only get like one you gave f bomb, it to Isa, right? Does uh, Isa get yes, it? Yes, Isa yeah. gets it. But we knew yeah. we only got one f bomb, and we were like, "Well, let's use it at the very beginning." As and, and there's just something to me. Helen Mirren saying, pipe the fuck down, Marie Curie. Did she record the line? Oh, yes. So this, the audio's there. There's the audio, audio exists. somewhere in the world of her saying, pipe the fuck down, Marie Curie, with like a proper British voice. But it just, it, it was it was something in the editing that didn't end up making the cut. But yes, that that was, I would say, the line that um, everyone was like, oh, no, no, no. Great line. That is incredible. Um, but it'll live on in this podcast. I love that. <laughs> now we have it. No, Rodrigo Prieto, I want to go back to him yes, for a second. Yeah, because yeah. there's two shots that I want to talk to you about yeah. from the narrative perspective as sure. a storyteller um, particularly mm. the heels shot which is yeah. when I saw that in the trailer that was really kind of when I got a sense of what this film was going to be about mm -hmm. and 
I wanted to talk to you about the design of that shot, um, yeah. how you decided how close up you were going to be, yeah. um, how long you were going to stay on it, but also even the shots of just her beautifully ascending into her car. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious what your conversations were like with Rodrigo. Like, sure. Well, I mean, Rodrigo and I spent a, a, a long time, over a year, talking before we were even officially in pre-production. And as as I did with Sarah Greenwood, who designed the sets, and uh, Jacqueline Duran, who did the costumes, and everything needed to be figured out from a filmmaking standpoint of like what the kind of philosophy behind everything was and how we were going to shoot it and and we wanted a set of rules for the way the camera moved especially in Barbie land and he wanted to well, the thing that we sort of came to is that we wanted the camera to be uh, mechanical but innocent the, mm. the camera doesn't have a sense of hiding around uh, doorways or anything. I mean, there is nowhere to hide in Barbie land, but also this kind of full frontal, these very clear moves that it doesn't feel like anything is hidden from the frame. And we shot in two to one because that's the best way to see people uh, f head to toe because it gives you a little bit more Versus headroom. Versus like 185? Yes, you shot 185 exactly. Because you 185 on Lady Bird, I think? 185 on Lady Bird and uh, on Little Women. Mm -hmm. um, but like anamorphic, you know, is long and, 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 and stretched out. But if, it's the same ratio they shot like Jurassic Park in yeah, yeah. because it just gives you, if you're a dinosaur or a Barbie, you need <laughs> like that extra <laughs> headroom. And I think um, w we wanted there to be a kind of elegant simplicity to all of it. Um, and especially, yes, at the beginning of the movie. And we had this idea that, um, that, everything would be seen as perfectly as it could be. There would be no sort of error at, at, at the beginning. And so uh, for the feet, it was, it was sort of to go to go back to how everything had to be figured out. I would say with the script, when we delivered it, when we were first talking to Warner Brothers, one thing they said, are you going to CGI all the feet? And I, I said, no, everything is going to be done practically. I don't want, I, I mean, that sounds hor horrifying, um, just to, for starters, but it was like how to do this completely practically. And those are Margot's feet. And, you know, it was like very simple, but we had to create like, you know, again, when you're figuring this out practically, it's like we had, she hits a mark, which has stickiness on the floor. So it holds the shoes and then she's holding onto a bar so she can step out. Like it's like all done practically in, in, in camera. And that was that was that shot. And then we had the same idea of like, we were like, the camera does the same thing every day and she's the one that's off. So like when she floats off her roof and that's when you sort of pull back and reveal everything and the timing is done the same way on the day w when she falls yeah. oh. is that the camera is still doing what it always does. She's just falling out of the frame. And we had... We had some more of that, but you know, you in editing, you kind of reduce to to what exactly it is. But it was sort of creating this um, this uh, this floating dancer quality to the camera. But it was always on a dolly. Like it's, I don't think it's on. All the shots are on dollies, and we had an amazing dolly grip who is. Um, it gives it that kind of uh, old musical look. Yes, yeah. it doesn't. Um, it doesn't feel. Um, haphazard. It's There's very... a lot of old musical yeah. yes. that I loved. Yes. As a follow-up, one thing I found interesting, I'm, I'm assuming the lenses are different in the real world in Barbie Land because I remember they Spielberg, are. Yeah, like for Ready Player One, Spielberg, yes. and Kaminsky, they shot 35 in real life and then digital in the, yes. in the game. So I was right. wondering, like, did you play around with ideas like that? We did. We'd actually talked about shooting the real world in film but but we, <laughs> but we, we shot, got very excited. But we, I know, I know. Um, you, sadly, yeah. Little Women was shot thirty five. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Little yeah. Women was shot thirty five. Yeah. But the, this, it was. So we 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 and stuck. All your money on pink. We spent all the money on pink. No, we we <laughs> shot in the. Um, we knew we wanted to shoot. It's funny. I, I don't have um, necessarily like a. I I love film, but with this movie, there was something about it where it's like because it's Barbie mm -hmm. and because it's plastic. Yeah. There was something about the hyper reality yes. of like the Alexa, oh, that's the Alexa 65 that yeah. I was like actually that's what I want I don't want any I want the total saturation the people we were looking at to try to emulate was like the Jacques Tati movies that were shot in 70 millimeter because that has that liquid color almost like you can put your hand into it oh, yeah. and I th and we talked about it and I was like this has this wonderful quality of like a you know 70 millimeter Jacques Tati but 
it's synthetic and the syntheticness is actually part of Barbie, yeah. which felt correct. It's like a philosophical thing. Whereas like little women, it's like, that's it. We're making a movie in the 1800s. Sure, it ha- it has it. to be yeah, yeah. a photochemical process yeah. because it's like what they had. Mm. But then when we moved to the real world, so we had that and we used uh, the, all the lenses we used had uh, no distortion or vin- vignetting around the edges because we wanted everything to go all the way to this oh, end. Okay. We didn't want anything to feel like it was sort of centered in the middle. But when we were in the real world, we switched to sort of lenses that had um that that were sort of more long lens mm-hmm. more captured there's more of a sense of the camera breathing mm-hmm. uh, it, it, i mean we used a shallow depth of field a lot in barbie led because it does have a, the effect of making everything look miniature mm-hmm. but in the real world it was like it was like uh, it has a vantage point it's not just sort of a pure presentation and that sort of longer lens has helped with that and then we shot all of it to um, just we we stopped using the large format sensor, and that was kind of how we we decided to go about it. Um, but we shot all the shinings in yes. um, <laughs> um, that was all shot in um, forty eight frames per second because we wanted it. To I was wondering, oh, it did look a yes, higher frame. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Was, so was, okay. so we did that, and then um, and then actually. Um, the sort of that without giving too much away, but the ending, um, which he made this beautiful uh, giant space filled with light, which was ex- it was this extraordinary like kind of feat that he did based on a lot of light installations that we'd both seen, and he used the colors of um, uh, J.M. Turner's paintings um, oh, in wow. LEDs behind uh, a smoked up scrim. And then we had this like reflective surface of, because I wanted it to look like walking on a beach, yes. like where you can see the reflection. Yeah. Anyway, so we did all of this stuff, but then at the, the very end, the final sort of shinings stuff that, again, not to give it too much away, but the one of the things that was pretty magical about that was um, the all the footage in that is actually the footage of... Um, the people who worked on the movie. I literally wrote that down in my notes. I was, are these the people who I, I had a feeling about that? Nuts. It's all the footage is from people, what, things childhoods. that they'd gotten childhoods. Their their mothers, their aunts, their sisters, their daughters. I mean, my editors. I mean, it makes me cry. But like his daughters in it, like oh. the editorial assistant, his mom who's passed away is in the movie. Like it's just like that. And I was like, I just feel like with these movies, you want to embroider them with as much actual heart hmm. th- that you can because they're only ever made by people. Yeah. I think that that something is that, you know, there were human beings who made everything. There's a human being who like yeah. made this. You like it's, can't make that AI. Yeah, yeah AI that's right. That's right. That. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not to, not to yeah. get into no, everything. But it is but, like, it yeah. is like I, and I think I'm a big believer in people being able to feel stuff like that through the screen. Yeah. But yeah, I know. I mean, in to, to go back to Rodrigo, who I cannot say enough about. I mean, I, and I was so honored that he worked on this movie. And uh, you know, he just finished making Killers of the Flower Moon, yes. oh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, he was yeah, 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 yeah. And then he came, and I was like, I, I did. I was like, Rodrigo. It's very hard for me to talk to you because I know that you've been talking with Scorsese <laughs> for the past year. And he was like, and he was so sweet, and he was like, Greta. I am just as much your DP as I'm Marty's DP. Oh, I love that. I'm here, yeah, right. to, I'm here to like yeah. do your vision on this movie, and I want to do it, and I think it's outrageous and wonderful. And it was like the most, you know, you know you're always, of course, riddled with self-doubt. And when a DP mm-hmm. like that who works with the people he works with, like, said, let's go, yeah. and I mean it, like, I think that's the part. It's like we wanted to mean it all. Yeah. Um, you yeah. feel, it. You feel it. Can you come on the show every week? <laughs> this is, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, you're very much the perfect guest for the show. Um, I think one of the scariest things that can happen for any guy watching mm-hmm. this movie is you find yourself relating to Ken. And I'm, I'm very nervous to tell you that my very first concert ever was Matchbox 20. Oh, hell yes. And so whenever... Well, I loved Matchbox oh, I 20. It's the best. Like, I loved Matt because I was born in 83 and Matchbox 20 yeah. was on the um, like on the top yeah. 40 rotation yourself or on, someone like you is an amazing yeah. album on quad 106.5 yes and um, <laughs> and I would like listen to all the FM radio stations yeah. in the car and you'd like switch between the ones that were like yes, yeah. you know you'd be like well if this one doesn't have it then maybe then this, this one yeah, does yeah. and um, 
And I love it. And it was just, it, honestly, it was just like later as an adult, I was like, what did that song mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I yeah. just didn't. Like, like and we were then, talking about. But like I think it was like written as a character, yeah. as like a, an emotional yeah. thing. But I was like, oh, this would be so funny yeah. if Ken loved this song. But yes, um, you know, I well, I think one thing. I, listen, I relate to Ken. So, <laughs> I mean, obviously. So, yeah, it's a it's a but I mean, Ryan is um they're both just outrageous and America and everyone. But like uh, Ryan, I, it's like the most astonishing <laughs> performance. It's um, honestly, I mean, I've not to like start talking about this sort of stuff this early, but like people are talking about like supporting actor nomination and I'm going like, yeah, like if that's the sort I'll of thing that doesn't, then what are we doing? But really it's quick, with, with Matchbox, like, do you reach out to Rob Thomas? I mean, do they know? Yeah, like, no, okay, they, so they're know. Fully they aware. know. This they know. Be, they know. It's opening yeah. weekend. Their phones are going to blow up and the Spotify yeah. numbers are going to go through. I mean, the honestly, I think, I hope it reinvigorates this song. Yeah. Also, I just, there was something about, like, um, I don't know, the idea of, like, this, this just, if you, th you know, you're sort of like, oh, I know, like, a, a beach, a guitar, a thing, and then it's just, like, everyone. Yeah. I just, like, it, it made me laugh so hard thinking about it. Um, but, yeah, it's funny because when we were shooting in the U.K., that song, well, a lot of the cast is younger, and also that song didn't really chart in the UK where the way it charted in the US. Sure. So actually a lot of the cast thought we had made up the song. What? Yeah, and I was like, "Oh no, this is a, this is a legit pop hit." Are we old? We could, like we're never, like now like I kids know. don't know what the I know. Well, they're going to know now. They're going to find out. I'm going to bring yeah, them. Yeah, the whole album like, is fantastic by the I way. I honestly was like I was like there are two songs that play like on repeat yeah. in like Barbie Land is Indigo Girls Closer to Fine, sure. which mm -hmm. I also love very deeply. And um, and Matchbox Twenty is like the you know push. There is another male reporter on this junket who has literally been in my apartment, taken a guitar off my wall, and started singing Matchbox Twenty. And he and I, when that moment happened, you were like, lean no. forward, no. and we were like, no. Well, I'll tell you, my, my first con, for, con uh, my first concert was. Uh, 311 featuring Sugar Ray. Yes! <laughs> I think I went to that tour. <laughs> yeah. what, what, what album was 311 on at that point? I, I don't even remember, but I, I, but I I had heard kids in like my in the cafeteria of junior high school talking about how they were all going to concerts and like and they were like, we're gonna go to this concert. And me being like the kind of like literal kid that I was, I was like, I shall go to Tower Records and purchase one ticket. And I did. I purchased one ticket and I went alone. And I spent the entire time being like, people were like, Where, who are you here with? And I said, oh, I'm just here with myself. <laughs> but I actually had, were a, awesome. I had a great time. It was a, this great, um, in Sacramento, they have a place called Memorial Auditorium where it's like a great venue for, for, for shows. And then I saw like, you know, Cake and Ani DeFranco and oh, all yes. those people there. Love yeah. it. There's a scene in this film that I that hit me so hard. Which it's America's monologue. Yes, yeah. It's yeah. truly one of the most incredible monologues I've seen delivered in film in a long time. Just because yeah. of what she's saying, it really makes yeah. you think about and everything that she says. So, from a filmmaking perspective, you mm -hmm. tell this story. We're sitting here right now talking about the movie that you made. But mm -hmm. I would imagine that there's like some therapy and catharsis <laughs> that comes out of telling the story. And through that monologue, I felt that was a lot of kind of like hearing the filmmaker's voice and hearing what was coming through the screen. I'm wondering, you know, what therapy or catharsis you found on the other side of this uh, project. Yeah, I mean, what was extraordinary about that? I, 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 I mean, I sent the script to America. I've, I've known America sort of uh, over the years uh, through friends of friends, and I've always thought she was such an extraordinary actress and also just uh, just as a person i mean she's just so smart and so thoughtful and i just I, I i really saw her in this role and i um and when she got the speech and we started talking about it she also shared with me um just certain things from her life and she again embroidered it with certain things that are very personal to her um that you know that only she could bring to it and then when she performed it and it took about a full day of shooting because it was, you know, we wanted to give it enough space and allow her to go into different places with it because there were takes where she just, you know, she wept through the whole thing because it was feeling, you know, and then she raged through some of them. She was exasperated. Like she really went through, I mean, I can't, it was such an exhausting, but cathartic, like you were saying moment to watch it. And the thing that felt special is, you know, it's that thing where if you're you're making something that comes from 
deep inside that feels almost scary and slightly embarrassing to say out loud. And then as you give it to collaborators and actors and and then they 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 say that's I have it. I have it, too. And then and then everyone who was all over because, you know, we're shooting the scene and then people are different places on this this stage and people just started coming one by one by one. And everybody's standing there just crying mm -hmm. as she's doing it. And they were just watching her. It was just it, it was a very it was it felt like she was suddenly speaking for everyone. Yes. And there was something in it. I don't know. Those moments happen sometimes. And you feel like whatever the alchemy is that brought us to this place, the way she embodies it made everyone feel like she was tapping into them. And it, and I think, you know, she's speaking about women, but I also think it's, it is so much about um, people feeling like they can't ever get it right. Yeah. And I think that that's true for men and for women and it's overwhelming and it's terrifying. And it's, and it's something where I was like, if Barbie has always been a thing where people say, if the criticism of Barbie is always that she's like some unrealistic expectation, I wanted a way to celebrate uh, the articulation of feeling like there is no way to win at this game as long as we have these bars set so high. And, and, and I think that that was, it was just the way she did it. It just, I mean, it still, it makes me cry still. And I've, I mean, I, I can't even tell you how many times I've watched it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Greta, they are giving us the wrap. We can oh, talk okay, to you yes. for another <laughs> half hour. We can talk to you all day, um, but we know you have a packed schedule. But we cannot tell you how much having you on our show means to us oh, and how much you. this conversation. Yeah. Thank you for nerding out with us. Oh, my God. And thank you for wearing these suits. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we're, I, we literally yeah. got these. We didn't wear this to the Fablemans. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, they didn't. No. <laughs> no, just, just this one. But seriously, thank you for taking the thank time. You. And uh, please so come much. back on. We'd love to have you back on anytime. Yeah. Yes. It was a real honor. Thank, thank you so much. You. Thanks so much. Thank you. We absolutely need to thank our good friends at Warner Brothers and, of course, Greta Gerwig uh, for taking the time to come on to the Real Blend podcast. If you guys watched the YouTube video aspect of it, uh, I will allow the boys to discuss their matching pink suits. But I do want to throw out that while I was not able to go to that interview uh, because I was on vacation, I'm glad I didn't get to go because I wouldn't have worn the pink suit. I couldn't. I mainly because I couldn't rock the pink suit the way that you guys can. No, that you guys attitude. have a no. I mean, just with a realistic attitude, um, you guys are able to pull off things that the, the this old body can't pull off. And you guys looked fantastic. So this Thank is a you. if you guys are listening this far and you haven't yet watched it on the YouTube channel, go and watch these two in their pink suits. And the funny thing about it, Jake, from what I understand, this was not coordinated at all. So, you know, that's what's interesting. And and this is such a microcosm version example of, of sort of kind of what happened with with Nolan, too, which is that sometimes you can't control outside factors leading into an interview with, you know, Kevin almost completely missing the Oppenheimer <laughs> junket, period. But, you know, one of the things and Kevin, I'm curious if you agree with this. I, I was a little worried walking into that Barbie room because, yeah, we both had this idea of wearing pink suits to the junket. A lot of people wore pink to the junket, to be honest with you. But Kevin and I had the exact same suit from the exact same vendor. Uh, so we, it looked like a scene out of Step Brothers. Um, and I honestly was a little afraid that, you know, us being her first interview of the day, that we were going to walk in and she was going to think, oh, this is like a bit or they're making fun of me or they're not taking this movie oh, seriously or, you know. And I really feel like, and look, I don't want to sit here and like use the entire hour to like pat ourselves on the back but like it really felt like whatever like one she actually did to seem to appreciate the 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 ensemble it perfectly matched the room but also once we started asking the sort of questions we wanted to ask her uh, a, a filmmaker of her caliber a movie of this caliber it seemed like the the suits sort of washed away like it was like it, like they, they they had the moment that they were supposed to have but if they had a second longer then then it would be doing a disservice to the fact mm -hmm. that we were in that room kevin what do you think i mean for people who don't who haven't seen any of the behind the scenes footage of this junket it was absolutely insane um you literally got up to the floor where the interviews were happening the elevator opened and the entire floor was pink carpet pink everything it was um, crazy it, 
it was it was like the biggest serotonin boost I've ever had in my life when these when these doors opened up. Um, and I so have Jake walked and I were those hallways. I'm, I'm sorry. I've walked those hallways before and like right down to the numbers on the doors. They changed, you know, the font to match Barbie stuff. Like I can't imagine what it took to convert that entire hallway of the uh, is the four seasons, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it yeah. was a looked incredible. brilliant. It was brilliant for marketing because everyone was Instagramming and 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 TikToking it. Um, I know Jake posted a whole video on his Twitter that got like millions of views and like just just literally the setting where we were. But back to Greta for a, a second because I do want to stress again to go to the YouTube channel because obviously the interview you just heard the beginning of the interview is her referencing the, the room that we're sitting in. Mm -hmm. She had a real camera from the movie right to her right. That was used in the film. A lot of the props and things like that. Um, we were, it, it felt like we were sitting in Barbie land with Greta Gerwig. It was, it was, it felt like a movie set. It was very cool. Um, also what I said at the top of the show, which I, when I, what that I want to reiterate is this is, you know, Greta is one of the greatest filmmakers working today, and this is a weekend of great cinema. And to sit with her and just talk about Kubrick and all these incredible filmmakers and influences that have been on Barbie. You know, Barbie has this idea of like, you know, it's pink and colorful, but the thematics and the, and the filmmaking aspects of it are so incredibly like it, it like it, it very much like you can interpret everything everything's important everything's you know you're thinking about things there's ambiguity there's vulnerability there it, it really is a film that kind of works on so many levels so to sit with her and talk to her about those layers and those filmmaking ideas and the shots. Rodrigo Prieto, who shot her film, uh, one of the best DPs in the business. And just, just to talk to her about the the lens choices and the way she decided to shoot the real world versus the actual, you know, in Barbie land. It was just really cool. So it was a end, very, would, would it be yeah. a difficult film to kind of do the four minute junket bit in? Because it feels like there's a lot to get to. With her, with Greta, yes. And okay. it's funny because Jake Jake and I, a little behind the scenes, Jake and I do were there for our television press junkets. We were interviewing Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling, America Ferrera, as well as Kate McKinnon and Issa Rae and Michael Sarah. Um, we were not getting Greta for television. Oh, gotcha. And then when, when we were sitting in that room for 30 minutes, it, it, it's funny you asked that. I had that thought in my mind. I'm like, I couldn't imagine having walked in this room for four minutes yeah, to talk to Greta right. Gerwig. Because... Just the the filmmaking history is just astounding to me. Like she is her and Noah Baumbach, who wrote the film uh, together. Uh, they're two of the you know two phenomenal filmmaker minds in this business. And and clearly this is Greta's movie. No question about it. She co-wrote it with Noah Baumbach. Um, but yeah, I don't I do not think a four minute interview would have done any good I, I need we needed to like break down these shots and yeah. Kubrick in 2001 and Dr. Strange love and all these crazy things so can I just really quick as much as I do love um shouting out our interview you guys had Hannah interview her as well who got some pretty killer yeah. stuff out of her for for cinema blend stuff that I in fact I actually saw it picked up by other outlets nationally before I even knew that it was you guys. Cause I was kind of curious. I was like, Oh, like who, cause it honestly, and this is, this is selfishly speaking, whenever I see a big headline sort of circulating, I always pause and go, wait, is that from our interview? Did that get pulled from ours? Um, yeah. But it didn't, it got pulled from Hannah's interview because she did a pretty killer job uh, as well. So I want to give a shout out to her. Absolutely. She really did. And I want her to do more of those. So hopefully we'll get her at more junkets. Um, let's shift over to a spoiler free review. We're going to do Barbie first. Uh, we'll do spoiler free reactions to it. And then we're we going we'll in alphabetical order. We're not doing any particular preference one way or the other. Barbie exactly. or Oppenheimer. Exactly. Well, well, yes, we are. It just makes sense because she's Damn on the it, show. <laughs> she's our guest this yes. week. And we're um, going in alphabetical order. I still haven't seen it. Um, I'm going to let the boys react to it. I do want to add when Kevin's mentioning what a big weekend for cinema this is. Michelle and I are going this weekend and it has been thrilling to try to get two tickets to this movie uh, oh, wow. this, this weekend because most of the theaters are packed, which I'm ecstatic about. Um, so, I mean, there's like a 9 a.m., which is great for Pop Pop. Like I, he's up, you know, he'll go see Barbie in, in a half empty theater. But I also do kind of want to go with like a crowd. I want to experience uh, this kind of comedy with a crowd. So we shall see. Um, but you guys give your spoiler free reactions to it. And then um, we will let you know when we transition over into uh, any kind of spoiler talk for for Barbie in case you guys want to skip ahead. Yeah, you know, this kind of this movie sort of falls for me under that umbrella of, um, you know, I always say you, you got to judge a movie for what it is, not what you thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. um, 
I will say it was a completely different film than I expected it to be. The the, the final results I loved. I thought it was uh, one of the funniest movies that I have seen this year. I thought it was a brilliant script. Some of the performances were absolutely incredible and amazing sort of ensemble cast. I hate to walk out of Barbie saying, you know, who's great? The guy. But Ryan Gosling, honestly, like if you were to have a serious conversation about a supporting actor nomination, I really wouldn't be upset about it. Like, I don't know why he shouldn't be allowed to be in the supporting actor conversation. I think he's just that good. Um, I do think, uh, you know, it, we always sort of talk about uh, questions and comments that we get from from people in our newsroom and people that we know. I, you know, I've got cousins who have kids, young kids who very much are looking forward to Barbie. And that's where it gets into that really interesting gray area where this is Greta Gerwig's Barbie for mm. better or for worse. You know, shout out to Warner Brothers for letting her make her movie. It is not a two hour long Barbie commercial. It is not, you know, one of those Barbie movies that I that sort of went to, to DVD. And you know, it is it, it has a lot to say about uh, women's place in the world, about men's place in the world, about women and men's relationship with each other, about toxic masculinity, about, uh, you know, a, a, a fragile ma- male egos in the wake of strong women. It's mm. got a lot to say. I think, you you know, many of us grew up watching movies that I think probably had a lot of stuff go over our head. Uh, my girlfriend and her daughter and I just rewatched the old um, Barry Levinson Adams Family movies recently, mm. and I haven't seen them in, in over 20 years. And in watching them, I'm going, oh, there are so many jokes in this movie I did not get. And, but I loved it as a kid and just didn't notice. And it makes me wonder if this is going to be one of those kinds of movies where I think kids are going to go see it. I do think that there's going to be enough there to keep them entertained. It's brightly colored. It moves pretty quickly. There are big musical dance numbers. And then I think it's going to be one of those movies that they revisit in 20 years and go, oh, mom and dad. You guys took me to a movie that I did yeah. not understand at all. That being well, said, a- you know. There's a running joke in the trailer about like the Kens beaching each other off. Yeah, beaching each other. You know, and there, there's a moment where Barbie pauses and asks other Barbies, "Do you ever think about dying?" There's right, an, right, there's an right. on, ongoing joke uh, featuring Matchbox Twenty, which is like one of my all time favorite. But like, and so it's one of those moments where like, as a 35 year old man, I'm dying laughing, and then after yeah. the movie, I'm going. I don't know who this movie's made for. Yeah, I don't right. think it was made for me, but I absolutely enjoyed it. Um, you know, I'll be very curious to to see how parents who are going to take younger kids feel about it. But again, like I said at the top, it falls under the umbrella of you got to judge a movie for what it is, not what you thought it was going to be walking through the doors. Uh, I, I really, really loved it. I, I for, for me, for, for first of all, Greta Gerwig, the filmmaking that she's been a part of, so far as a filmmaker is astounding. I mean, Lady Bird and Little Women are Little Women in particular for me was it was a masterpiece. It was just it was incredible. Just everything that, about that film, the, the shots, the performances, every, everything. And what I love is looking at those three movies in particular. And I, I know she's been involved in tons of other projects. But when I'm looking at those three films in particular, it, it, what I see is d- uh, so much difference and so much similarity in between like what she's trying to say as a filmmaker. Her voice is so strong in every one of her films. But when I'm looking at Barbie, um, I can't stop thinking about America Ferreira's performance. Mm. Um, And I I bring her up because she has a monologue in this movie that I, I cannot stop thinking about. I saw this movie a month ago and there are lines of dialogue in this monologue. That I think it's one of the greatest monologues I've seen on in film in a long time. Wow. And there's something about what she says in this monologue that is so impactful. I thought about my mom and so many other women in the world and the idea of what's going through their minds in certain moments throughout their lives. And it's just the way she puts it and the way she explains it is so brilliant. And that's all I will say. I'm not going to spoil what it is. But to me, that's the moment of the movie. That's the movie in a nutshell to me. And that scene floored me absolutely floored me um looking at the obvious leads with margo and and ryan they're fantastic gosling is incredible he fully fully committed to this role and like the the bit is so great and like what i love about this film in terms of the emotional arcs of it it's really interesting i do wish there was a little more fish out of the water aspects because as Barbie and Ken go to the real world and I won't spoil anything, but I kind of wanted a little bit more about with that. But overall, like visually, it's shot 
incredibly, impeccably uh, by Rodrigo Prieto and uh, and just the music and the score. I think my only issues really were I thought that at times the tones of the movie were a bit conflicting. Um, I thought that at points it, it wanted to be one thing and then it was another thing and then back and forth, which I'm totally fine with the filmmaker switching up the voice and the tone of the film. But sometimes there's a con- conflicting element that happens with those tones that I that threw me off a little bit, took me out a little bit. But it wasn't enough to like hurt the film overall. I, I just think that this is like Jake said, this is Greta Gerwig's Barbie and this is made by Greta Gerwig and it is her voice through and through, you hire a big filmmaker like that and you actually get her voice. And I think that both the arcs that Ken and Barbie have in the film that Margot and Ryan have are fascinating. And the performances, there's so many incredible performances in the film, but I can't stop thinking about America's monologue. I'm telling you this monologue, I want to watch it on a loop. I want to go see it again just to watch the monologue. Wow, and okay. I, I, I just think that it's to me, that's it's it's one of the most powerful things I've seen in a while in a movie. Um, it, it feels like someone made a big studio film with an indie feeling in terms of like it, it doesn't feel like it's conforming to anything in Hollywood. It is just itself. And well, you got to give the film credit for doing that for 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 just saying this is what our movie is and i don't care what you think this is what we're going to do and it's um, tracking and at 100 it work. yeah it's tracking at 110 million dollars so maybe yeah. we should do more of this well yeah <laughs> you know we kevin should. kevin was talking about like the, how this weekend is is just a win for for moviegoers but these movies doing well because right now obviously we're recording before they come out but both oppenheimer and barbie are projected to do very well this weekend i mean if barbie opens at 40 that's huge for a three hour R rated biopic. Like that's, that's, that's a win. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. Um, can I, so can I, these, Oh no, please. Well, okay. So box office pro is, is who I've credited for some of these projections, but remember they've been, they felt high and then they felt pretty, uh, uh, accurate mm-hmm. right now. They have Oppenheimer three day weekend forecasts, uh, domestic 64.7. <gasps> what? That's, that's and sexy. Barbie at one fifty eight point five. What? what? Yeah, like that's like that. Like if that what? doesn't tell studios, look, do you see what happens when you allow like great wow. filmmakers to make so their, their movie? Their range for for Barbie, which they are, uh, which I forget what the last big film was. It felt high, but it ended up being right. Their range for Barbie is one forty uh, to Mario. One. Remember when they they super projected Mario to be super and high? And we Mario, were like, yeah. no. So they have Barbie one forty to one seventy five, and Oppenheimer fifty two to seventy two. And keep in mind, a few weeks ago, Bar- uh, Oppenheimer was at 49 yeah. and Barbie was at like 95 or 100. And, right. you know, J- Jake and I famously made a bet about this. And I it, I conceded if you're just tuning in for the first time. Jake and I had a pause. Yeah, so Jake and I am I'm hosting a pause event next week if you want to throw your hundred bucks at it. There we go. I will. So Jake and I had a bet going <laughs> on. That I thought Oppenheimer was going to open bigger than Barbie. Now, in my defense, this was prior to the film getting in the R rating, right. learning it was Which three Which we said hours. was way too um, early for you to feel so confident yeah. at the time. Yeah. Um, I want to say but, real quick, a little bit of context for that number. Um, if Barbie opens to 158 and if their mission they have at 25.8 domestic, Barbie and its opening weekend will gross missions Damn. domestic total Damn. the same weekend. Wow. And, and also, I, I, I thought mission was going to do better. But one of the things I do want to think, point uh, out, though, global, it's at 240. Yeah, it did good globally. Yeah. yeah. One thing, though, I want to point out, though, in terms of like the bet that Jake and I made, because a couple weeks ago I conceded like w- w- they, there was this one day when a, I think a Barbie trailer came out where they everybody online was able to take their face and put themselves mm-hmm. in the Barbie poster. And I saw other people from different studios doing it. I'm like, OK, this is going to be huge. <laughs> yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> and so what's fascinating to me, though, and I, and I said this on the air the other day, like I, I'm I'm dreading Monday morning. I'm dreading the headlines that Barbie destroyed Oppenheimer or Barbie oh, beat Oppenheimer. And, and and I and I I need people to understand that, like to Jake's point to to our bet, which I was wrong about, and I have no problem admitting that. It, there's no competition here. It's not even. It's not even. It's not even. At this point, you have a three-hour R-rated biopic that's going to open up. And, and I believe, and Gabe, correct me if I'm wrong. 
I think Bar- Barbie's in 4,200 screens, and I think Oppenheimer's in about 3,600. 36, yeah, 42 but, to 36. So and there, can I give you so my... 600 less screens. Can I give you yeah. my optimistic um, uh, prediction for what the headlines would be? Because I because you're not wrong. That's kind of, that's, you know, cynicism yeah. settles. Um, but given that the summer box office has been so trepidatious this year, I think that mm. if a movie opens to 160 and then another movie opens to almost 70 in the same weekend, I think the headline will be two huge openings in a summer, a yes. lackluster summer. Yeah. Like I think that I think both will get sort of their due if they're both end up being that high. Also, it's very important to note that like, and I've said this before on the show and I think you guys agree with me. I mean, this movie is opening on Nolan's name. I mean, like, like everybody in this cast is huge and Oppenheimer, but to the, to Jake's point, it's, it's about the father of the atomic bomb. It's coming out in the middle of the summer. It's a three hour biopic. It's black and white in color. A um, three so, hour R rated biopic. Right. right. So let's, and get, so, let's uh, get into to the do, reactions but, to Oppenheimer. Yeah. Let's transition into this. And Kevin, since you have the floor, why don't you, Nolan, your boy, why don't you start with your spoiler free reaction to, uh, the latest film from from Christopher J. Nolan. Um, OK, I, I saw middle, this movie. Throwing a middle initial in there. <laughs> I'm not even sure if that's correct. I don't, I'm not, just, I, don't, I don't think it is. It just sounds like a one in 26 what chance. Hey, Sean, what does the J stand for? Nothing, actually. Just Jeff. <laughs> J. Um, Robert Oppenheimer. We're recording this on July 19th. I saw the film on July 6th. Um, every single day that has passed since I saw that film, I, I've I've become more and more enlightened um, in the scale and the scope of what Nolan is doing. I mean, I, I walked out loving it and being blown away by it, but this is a film that genuinely sits with you. I, it's been, it, it put an imprint on me in a way. And Matt Damon said this, uh, in our interview, he goes, I can't believe that we're not thinking about this every second of our day. I'm paraphrasing him, but how are we not thinking about this more often and the ramifications and, and, and things that occurred because of this moment in history. Mm. I mean, for people, you know, the idea that they were going to press this button and there was a rem- any chance whatsoever that the entire anything world anything above zero is terrifying. <laughs> that the entire world, <laughs> yes. what the atmosphere would be ignited and humans would cease to exist. Yes. is insane. And and I don't know that I ever thought about it from that scale until watching the film and reading the book. Um this is this is one of the most profound and important films I've seen in my lifetime, for sure. Um, I I find it to be terrifying and horrifying, um, this this film. And, and I mean that in, in the best way possible. It, it awakens you to the idea like I'm now walking through life a little bit more scared about where we are in the world. It, I genuinely am. And I mean that because. Nolan immersed me in this time period so much with the use of IMAX and the use of sound design and score and and performances that I felt like he took me from 2023 and dropped me in those decades in the 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. And I or even earlier than that, like like I felt like I was taken to that time and I know I wax poetic about IMAX a lot on this show, but I I need to be clear about something with this. IMAX generally is con, con, yeah, generally used, I guess people would say, for like big action and big scope. This is not this is all intimate to me. This is the, the most, in my opinion, the most intimate yet epic film I've ever seen. And I say that because a lot of the IMAX shots are just on faces talking and when you're seeing a face on an eight story screen, an eight story IMAX screen projected on 70 millimeter film, IMAX film or however you're seeing it, it is astounding to watch someone's face and how they process information and that moment. And you're right there with them. The ambiguity, the nuance, the subtlety, the restraint. This is this is a filmmaker at his master level. This is the best film he's made in his career. Um, Interstellar is wow, still my favorite. Listen to you. Wow. Interstellar and Oppenheimer are tied for number one. Oppenheimer, I think, is the best movie he's made. Just like I said with Tarantino's this is so, Hollywood. Sorry being, to interrupt you because I know you're on a roll, but this is so Interstellar. It's funny that you put those together. So yeah. much of this film, I was like, wow, this feels like Interstellar in yeah. so many ways. 
And I think, you know, the idea that there's no, you know, he didn't use CGI for the Trinity test, the the practical effects, um, the way he does things in camera when you're in Oppie's mind and you're seeing all those crazy firestorms. That's all practical, done, microscopic, miniature. It's it's insane. The last thing I'll say is this. Um, go back to Memento. There was a brilliant use in that film. I told you guys this. He used color subjectively and then he used black and white objectively. So with Oppenheimer, the entire story is told in those two different color formats, black and white and color. Subjectively, we're in J. Robert Oppenheimer's subjective POV, all in color. And then he cross cuts with the black and white, which is the objective, which is Robert Downey Jr. Louis Strauss's particular part. And it's because of that cross cutting that creates this brilliant ambiguity where you as the audience have to work to figure out where you are, who, where are you? Who do you, who do you side with? Wh what information do you need to understand? Are you following it through his eyes or are you following it through the black and white sequences? And I think that push pull as an audience member in IMAX over Ludwig's score with Hoytema's incredible cinematography, it's to me, it's, it's just pure freaking cinema, man. Like it is genuinely some of the most profound feelings I've had in a movie, but I'm telling you guys, it's it's the after for me. It's the aftershock of the movie for me. I mean, you know, you feel this movie in your bones like I, I like I genuinely feel a slight sense of terror in my stomach as I walk around now because you I'm telling you it like this film and we'll get into spoilers, but there's something else I want to say, but I'll say it in the spoilers. But I loved it. Right. Um, and I know this is predictable. Kevin loves Nolan. Kevin loved this movie. I'm not the only one. I think Paul Schrader said it was the most important film of art of the century. Um, Jake's boy, it's Richard a, Roper, it's said it's one of the best films of the century. That was, a, that was an, an extreme reaction and to him. Killian became Oppenheimer. He, that performance, and Downey, and Florence, well, and Emily Blunt. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, all right, so I'll go next because I'm not the Nolan guy on the show. Um and and I I like to make jokes about Nolan, how sometimes his intelligence gets ahead of him um, and he he knows he's smarter than the audience. And 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 sometimes that that keeps him at a distance for me, whether it's um, Tenet, which I love, but you got to work really hard to figure out where you're at. And sometimes you have to watch multiple times in order to figure out what, where Nolan was the whole time kind of thing. Um, Interstellar, you know, sometimes I think he's thinking ahead. This to me was Nolan using the tricks that he loves, the color schemes that Kevin talked about to put you in different time frames, um, using the tools that he loves IMAX um, to the best of their ability to tell a story that I think he was building towards um telling his entire life and and only yes. because i can't think of another experience and this might just be my ignorance of where we had a a, a moment in time where um a, a human decision could have had such ramifications as global decimation <laughs> legitimately global decimation um mm -hmm. and so nolan loves a ticking clock and he loves getting to that point. But 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 and I think that the uh, Trinity test sequence is phenomenal. But what I was more interested in and and Jake and I made this connection um, as soon as we stepped out of it was that I, I've been calling this kind of Nolan's JFK, because what I think he does is I think he takes um, history his version of history, it's still an interpretation. And, and people already have been arguing with me on Twitter of like, well, JFK is filled with you know, conspiratorial BS and Oppenheimer's accurate, but that's not, that's not the point I'm trying to say. The point I'm trying to say is it's a filmmaker using their tools, whether it's Oliver Stone using his tools or Nolan using his tools to tell their version of a very important event in history. Now Stone will lean a little bit more towards the conspiratorial, conspiratorial, you know, the government is doing this and, and we're suspicious with Nolan. There's this fascinating dynamic of the smartest people on the planet, um, of which I often say Nolan is in that group, yeah. being so excited to put theory uh, into work, you know, to to build these bombs, to build this weapon, to 
to race other scientists in other countries, you know, to be the first ones to do it. And then there's a moment over the course of that conversation where you start to realize that, oh, wait, if we succeed, <laughs> it's going to change life forever. Um, and and I think Nolan does an incredible, incredible job of making us feel that weight. And there are so uh, without getting into any more of the details, what I will just say is the most remarkable thing about Oppenheimer is that everyone in the cast is directly in their lane. Matt Damon steps up to the plate and gives you that Matt Damon performance that exactly what you need out of him. So uh, good. Emily Blunt for a long time, you'll be watching and thinking like, what is she getting at here? What's the point? What's the point? And then she has a scene near the end where everything that she's been doing up to that point comes home. Um, Florence Pugh has an amazing moment. There's a litany of of cameos and scenes and one act bits where you're like, oh, that dude's in this. Oh, my God. Or, oh, my God, she's in this. Holy How cow. Was Josh Hartnett. Hartnett was incredible i will I mean, say uh if you haven't seen him his episode of wow, black mirror black that mirror. just came out his episode Beyond is on the sea it's a, it's with, a with your boy Hartnett. aaron paul aaron yes. paul it's great yeah it's really it's good. terrific um i mean you can go down benny the list Safdie. kenneth brana uh benny saft i mean all these people it's like nolan cast the exact right people to do the exact right things um, and all I'll say in the spoiler free take on it is three hours felt like 75 minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, this Ooh. thing flew by. Sean, and you said whenever before the film began, jokingly, I'd love to see Nolan's 90 minute film. And when the movie was over, do you remember I leaned over and I went, you kind of just saw Nolan's 90 minute <laughs> film. Yeah, it really uh, was. I'll also never, ever forget Sean after the movie ended because I had been bothering these guys for years about this movie saying we weren't ready and all these things. And like, well, you know, every I, Nolan, I need a Nolan break, every Nolan. <laughs> but you what did you say to, when the movie I ended? Over, as Sean soon as it ended, I leaned over to Kevin and I said, I have been giving you a really hard time about this movie, making fun of you for your anticipation. And I apologize because <laughs> I was completely wrong and you were completely right <laughs> and this movie was beyond everything that i had hoped that it was going to be um so yeah i i, I cannot recommend it enough it is my number one movie of the year and this is when something like across the spider-verse exists which is so tailored wow. to me uh and is such a work of art but i honestly think at this moment oppenheimer is ahead of it jake i don't think you are gonna differ too much from us i'm not gonna come at you guys and be like this movie sucked no <laughs> the movie's fucking great um i my my favorite single moment that that christopher nolan has ever directed is the interrogation scene between Batman and the Joker mm. in The Dark Knight because it perfectly exemplifies how brilliant of a filmmaker that Nolan is, that you can strip away everything. You can strip away action. You can strip away spectacle. I mean, the lighting of that scene for a huge portion of it is literally just a light bulb that, mm -hmm. is, that mm. is lighting uh, both Heath Ledger's face and Gary Oldman's face before uh, Bale shows up. It's just the perfect sequence that is honestly – as heart racing and tense and exciting as any other action scene in that movie or quite frankly any other action scene that Nolan's ever directed. I think that scene is a perfect small example of what makes Oppenheimer work. It's that sort of tension of just two people talking, just two conversations. Because I, what, Kevin, you talked about uh, being concerned about some of the narratives that are going to come out of, of this weekend with the box office. My concern of, of one of the narratives that's going to come out of Oppenheimer this weekend is people go, oh, it's just people talking the whole time. It's just, and, yeah, and granted, it is a lot of dialogue. It is a dialogue driven, heavy conversation based film, but it Can is I, done. So, oh, please. I was going to say, I think we're going to overlook because of the technical aspects of it. I think it's Nolan's script. best script. It's all a hundred percent. And it is, yes. but it just it's proves that he well can, yeah, like, like that interrogation scene from the dark Knight, he can make, 
a conversation between two people or 10 yeah. people or a boardroom of people feel like an action scene. And that's mm-hmm. not easy to do because a lot of people have been trying to do it. There's a reason that we still look at 12 Angry Men and go, how the hell is that movie so great? Because yeah. if it were that easy to just get 12 guys in a room and make it a masterpiece, people wouldn't be spending $300 million on Indiana Jones. They would just put a bunch of guys in a room <laughs> and spend $12 on it. And it'd be a masterpiece. All right, let's shift to spoilers right now. So we're going to talk about some specifics about Oppenheimer. So if you're listening to this before having gone to see it, skip forward. Um, and come on back and listen to these conversations. Jake, before I throw it over to you, there is a point that I want to bring up that that I've heard from three different people today um, who love the movie, but talk about the fact that, uh, and now you're in spoiler territory, the movie post-Trinity test, like it, it almost feels like everyone going into the movie or people going into the movie think that the Trinity test is going to be the end of the movie. Um, and you have to almost like re- get excited about a trial, you know, or and a cabinet position approval, which in the grand scheme, you might feel like this isn't as important, even though I think a lot of the dialogue that's happening in those two scenes, one is like a deposition for charges about, that are facing uh, Oppenheimer and one is for the, the Downey Jr. character. Uh, I, I do understand that a little bit. I was still riveted by it, but I could see some people after the Trinity test being like, Oh, I don't really know if I need the rest of this movie. But Jake, you had a point you want that, to. That's the brilliance, though, is the is the coldness after that. Um, that's why it's that's why it's interesting. Yeah. You know, that, well, that, that perfectly leads into sort of one of the things that I most appreciated about the movie. And this kind of weirdly enough goes hand in hand with Barbie, because Oppenheimer was a much different movie than I expected it to be um, in the sense of, of what it was that was thrilling me. Uh, you know, I was a, a very captivated and, and excited by a lot of the the, the courtroom proceedings and, and the small, uh, you know, it, you know, sort of like boardroom conversations that were being had. And I walked into that movie expecting for the Trinity test to be the most impressive aspect of the film. But I right. think what the most impressive aspect of the film is, is that it's not the Trinity test. It's yeah. right. conversations. It's courtrooms it's boardrooms it's small moments between two people in silence the fact that an atomic bomb blowing up is not the most captivating part of that movie right. to me is the ultimate win to me the the most compelling scene is him in that school gymnasium and yes. nolan oh. messing with the sound of the audience yeah and, and him feeling it's the way that nolan conveys because you have to assume that oppenheimer carried with him this amount of uncertainty uh, and then guilt of the ramifications of what he created and the way that Killian Murphy combined with Nolan convey that is just you know, staggering. You know, what's funny. And I didn't think yeah. about this till just now. That's kind of like a, um, it's kind of like the scarecrow effect. What's what's what he does mm. with Oppenheimer oh, behind him. That's really funny. That's Killian Murphy. And it's very much that's what happens to funny. scarecrow. We talk about Nolan using his tricks and sort of yeah. building up to this. That's really funny that he uses the very subtly what do you the scarecrow. Th- guys, effect. think and this I, I don't. It, it, it did not bother, but I've heard this from from a few people that makes me go, why so bad? Why did you see, need to see that so badly? It did not bother me that we do not see the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I I'm mean, glad like, you think about it. If you, I yeah, think that is very it, important that we do. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you think about it, and th- this is going to sound like a weird comparison, it reminds me of like in War of the World, Spielberg doesn't show the things that the main characters don't see. You know, like the, whatever is going on over the hill or whatever the case may be. Sure, sure, and, sure. I mean, you have to think at that time, a lot of people really weren't seeing what was going on over there yeah. and yeah. I, I did not need to see a quarter of a million people dying I, to understand no. the impact and short I, of like the need like people wanting to see the, the, the big screen spectacle of it I, but I don't know what it says about the fact that people feel the need that they need to see that I think that's not no. what this movie was though 100% this I agree with you about, I agree with this you. movie was about understanding the impact yeah. and empathizing with that, whereas yeah. showing that would be sensationalizing. Wait, that, that scene Let in the gym go. said everything that exactly. trying to show Hiroshima or Nagasaki could have ever done. Let me tell you an example. Um, Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor. You could have done a movie like Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor and never showed the attack, mm-hmm. but showed the build up to it and then the ramifications of it. Sure. 
But Bay made Pearl Harbor so that he could shoot the attack. Sure. <laughs> Nolan didn't make this movie right. so that he could show the bombings. <laughs> Nolan was way more interested in the before and the after. It's so and funny that you make that comparison approaches. because that the, the absolutely brilliant moment with Gary Oldman reminded me of like, oh, this is what Bay was trying to do with John Voight as FDR. Was it right. FD, FDR? Uh, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was like, this is like, it just kind of reminded me of like, oh, this is a good version of that scene. Wait, didn't he stand up? He's didn't like, he, oh yeah, he like stands up out of his up. wheelchair. Um, <laughs> which like, no, I, you know, I don't know if I that think actually that, happened. That, I think that might have happened. Okay, I think that actually might be based on. In, in on, the context of a Michael Bay movie, it didn't, yes. it didn't play great. Well, in fact, so, the more important scene is Killian not being able to look at the newsreel footage of you hear it mm -hmm. and and him looking away and not being able to actually face it is far more impactful i think than having shown anything that that, yeah, that if, if, you, if you're disappointed that you didn't see hiroshima and nagasaki you need to ask yourself what kind of movie you wanted to see going into this because i feel like uh, you and got i think you're just fundamentally missing the point of the the movie like that would have felt like exploitation sure, 100%. I, th I think that this movie until its final frame is asking you to contemplate the reality of what happened. And, mm -hmm. and that the fact that, especially here in America, we live in a society that very quickly tried to forget that. Mm -hmm. And I think that this movie is trying to highlight it, not in a way that says, look how, look how destructive this is and look at the, yeah. and actually look at the loss of life, but to have you actually feel it and contemplate yeah. it, feel well, it and, through his yeah. performance. The so fact that we looked at Hiroshima, oh, so I was gonna say, the fact that we looked at Hiroshima and Nagasaki and our immediate reaction as a country was, how can we do this bigger is yeah, terrifying. Exactly. Yeah. Well, but I mean, to talk to Kevin's point of view about feeling fear in the aftermath of this movie, like Nolan doesn't let you off the hook at the end no. of this film. No. Um, he has that confrontation. And so one of the things Gabe and I were talking in side chat today of just like that Alden Einrenrich uh, uh, line at the mm. end where he says to Downey's character, like, hey, maybe, oh my God. maybe they were talking about something more important than you. Kind oh, of thing. The, the, that, that revisiting. Oh. Oh, that revisiting of the Eisenhower, the, or the Einstein sequence. I love that we kept revisiting that and the payoff. The fact that that's the end of the movie was brilliant. That's why I'm saying it. this is his best script. This I'm saying this is this is Nolan's best script in terms of structure and payoff. Before Gabriel. we wrap up, because we're getting to the end of the show, I did want to point out one thing that I pointed out to Sean, and it's again, it's in reference to we've had a lot of fun um, countering Kevin's enthusiasm over the last year or whatever. Uh, it is, you know, making fun of the, the the marketing stuff. But I pointed out something that I was feeling in the uh, in the screening, and I and I mentioned this to Sean in, in the side chat, which is that the Trinity test. We know what happens. Like, in, we know that it's going to work. We know that the bomb gets made, and we know what comes after that. But everyone in that scene, the emotion that they're feeling is anticipation. What is going to happen is what everyone in that scene is asking. And because there was such, and for people at our level, maybe, I don't know that everyone's going to have this, this feeling, but anyone at our level who's interested in the filmmaker, interested in Nolan, in that moment, given that we knew that there was no CGI and, and all this mystery about how are they doing the Trinity test, we were all feeling the same thing as what's about to happen? What am I going to yeah. see? And mm -hmm. it was this really incredible way to do that thing that we talk about that, that directors is their job, which is to get you to lean in, is to get you to feel whatever the person on the screen is feeling. And I thought that was such a brilliant trick, whether completely conscious or just a bit of a happy accident, to be sitting there leaning in, knowing that the bomb's going to go off, but going, what is it going to look like? Like, how did yeah. he do this yeah. practically? What does that mean? I was feeling exactly what they were feeling for a different reason. And I thought that that was just, it blew me away in that moment. Also, can we shout out the sound design? Because now we're in spoilers. We can talk about this for people who obviously if you're this far, you've heard this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll have the time. Way Kev, he... We'll have time next week because we're. I think next week we're going to do our top fives. I imagine yeah. this is going to make your top five. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So we'll, we'll have time to give it some more spoilery flowers. But but yeah, I want to say one thing, though, about the sound design. The, and Gabe brings up a brilliant point because you don't put that in the marketing we you're right like we're kind of them we we are 100%. them objective or subjectively in that moment mm -hmm. but what's brilliant about that 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 whole sequence like in terms of watching that is is really kind of how you the sound design is used um because the bomb is so far away the way that nolan uses sound in that scene sucking it all out and then when he hits you with that mm -hmm. effect I jumped back in my freaking seat, man. And also 
the you know, now I've become death destroyer of, of worlds. Um, that line famously he talked about in a famous interview where, you know, I love that Nolan didn't have him say it in the moment. Mm. It's it's done. It's done off camera. Like we, we're assuming it's in his mind. I'm assuming the way it's the way it's done. Um, and Do it's we know so when smart. he was supposed to have said it. Do we know what the well, actual moment well, from from what I understand from a historical standpoint, I don't know that he said it then uh, okay. in the interview that he did. I believe he talks about and Jake, you saw the interview. It's like I think he talks about how that's what he felt in the moment. Like he, he, like he, he said, said the moment reminded him of the yes. Hindu scripture. It, okay. and, and he had been reading that scripture and that and, and obviously we're in spoiler territory. He early on in the film member Florence Pugh has him yes. read that. Right. Yeah. And so yeah, yeah. that whole callback. But. Anyways, we'll we'll wax poetic about this more later, but yeah, that last Indeed, line, simple that last oh, line, it's amazing. Man. I have so much to say about that last line as well. Oh. Simple yes or no oh. from around the table because we talk about the supporting actor categories. Um, you know, work you could have a scene and and win. Emily Blunt does have a lot to do in this, but does she yeah. get nominated for that yes. scene of her at the table? Dude, when Florence Pugh is staring at Killian. Well, hang on. Well, well, she's, you say yes. Jake, do you think she gets a nomination supporting specifically for that scene? Yeah, because I th- I think they're going to be, you know, I, uh, you know, what, not, not necessarily that she doesn't deserve it because she does, particularly for the back half of the film. But I also think that, like, nominations are going to be so wide sweeping. I, th- I think you've got potentially three solid chances at at. Uh, you've got a lead actor, you've got a, I'm assuming maybe a supporting actress and then supporting actor for Downey. Like, it's honestly nice to be reminded that Downey is a great freaking actor. Like, that, Man, and I feel like what a not to take anything ball, away from character. Yeah. yeah. Not to take like, anything away from his work in the Marvel movies, but like, you know, he, he did an interview um, with Rolling Stone a few years ago where he talked about, I think, I want to say like, like having been nominated for Oscars, but losing. And I think his quote was like, don't worry, I'll win someday. Huh. And I remember when Doolittle came out and then maybe thinking like, <laughs> maybe not, dude, maybe not. Uh, but, but then, but, but dude, then seeing this I, film, I, I going, still defend like, Doolittle. I still defend Doolittle as a, do you not for me, but for kids, it was a great kids movie. I use the word slime ball for, for Downey's character. Do you, do you guys remember like the way he would put his hair back Mm-hmm. And he would remove his scarf. That character was a snake. He played him like a snake. It was like a really, really, really great performance. Like he's brilliant in that performance. Robert Downey Jr. Man, what an actor! What an actor! I don't think yeah. uh, I don't think Blunt makes it, but we'll see. I'm gonna say no. I mean, Blunt. it's you know we're, we're six months in. It, it honestly, said, sort of depends. I just on, want to point out, Gabe said, "Quick around the horn, yes or no?" And yeah. Yes. <laughs> and nobody gave him that at all. Uh, but I do think I think Killian's a lock. I think Downey's a lock. I think the screenplay is a lock. I think Nolan's going to get director and I think he's going to get picture. I don't think they I'm not sure what they're going to win. I'm just saying nominations sound. right now. Look at yeah, sound. yeah, yeah, yeah. Things Score. like that. Score. But I mean, in the top categories. I think, I th- top I think categories. For, for Blunt, I think if if audience members, are, if people who vote watch the whole film, it leaves you with a very like she she you ends the get film. To that. Yeah, she ends the film stronger than she begins it. So yeah, I yeah. think if they finish the entire movie, which we've learned that not all voters do. Um, <laughs> you know, no, exactly. don't. I, know, I know it's asking a lot to finish the freaking movie. Yep. Um, but and shout you know, out they, to Ludwig. Yeah. Shout out to Ludwig's score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So listen, um, this weekend is being defined by people going to the movie theaters and double featuring it. So I want you guys to head to the comments down below after listening to this interview and tell us uh, the last double feature that you remember doing in a movie theater. When's the last time that you actually spent a day uh, in the theaters? Oh, that's interesting. Strangely, mine has to do with Nolan. And I'll tell that story. uh, I'll tell the story briefly next week. Please tell me it was Dark Knight and Mamma Mia. It was not, <laughs> although that sounds like a great, great double feature. Um, OK, we're going to get out of here. Uh, plug the Nolan interview. Go go listen to the Nolan interview if you haven't yet. And uh, again, thanks to Greta Gerwig for joining us for Barbie. That's fantastic. Um, we'll be back next week with a brand new show. You can listen to us, listen to us or follow us in the meantime on our social media channels. We are at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kovach. The show is at Real Blend. Kev. And keep sending me your zip codes. Yes. Um, I've gotten I've gotten dozens and dozens of people like tweeting me their zip codes. I'm, I, and I'll help you find a 70 millimeter IMAX or an IMAX one for one, four, three near you. I have no problem doing it. I find it 
to be one of my favorite things to do. And people tell so me great. I, I've had I've had people telling me that they're flying and driving hours to go to these movies, uh, to see them in IMAX. And one guy told us he's going to take his son. They're going to go to Providence, Rhode Island and see it in 70 millimeter IMAX there. So Kevin's had people from like me. Australia and Norway. And, and the and crazy Paulus. thing is that Kevin guarantees that you love the movie. And if you don't, he'll pay for your trip. That's not true at all. Do not. That is not. That is not okay, true. Okay, that's it for all. this week's Real Blend. All right. Bye, Blue guys. Beetle. <laughs>